Mr. Reeves, uh, for the introduction. It's been it's a pleasure to be here and share with you some thoughts on future proofing uh, mixed farming systems and in keeping with the theme of this session, Opportunities Beyond the Farm Gate. However, the title of my talk this afternoon could equally be something related to the challenges of improving the policy and regulatory settings of food manufacturing in Australia. For quite clearly, opportunities beyond the farm gate can only be developed if the sector has the cap capability and the capacity to provide value-adding capability sufficiently competitively against a range of both domestic and international benchmarks. And I need to say right off the onset that this is a at this moment, we're at a serious crossroads for produce processing and food manufacturing in Australia. My talk today will share some of these thoughts with you. Whether we're talking about rain-fed agriculture, irrigated agriculture, or farming systems that use a combination of the two, in the vast majority of cases, water still remains the ultimate limit of productivity in Australia and Australian farming systems. So the competitiveness of Australian agriculture on world markets and the competitiveness of value adding comes down to a very simple equation relating to one, the amount of water that's available for agricultural production and two, our capacity to convert that water into saleable products on world markets and three, a value chain cost structure that's equal to or better than competitive countries worldwide. I believe that Australian agriculture has to change. Theme two of this forum is titled, to, uh, to value add or not to value add, that's the question. I contend that to stay competitive in a changing world, Australian agriculture has no option but to increase its value adding. But this must be done in a way that maximizes competitiveness, maximizes opportunity, and maximizes financial return. We've been fortunate in Australia, where agriculture has been able to continue to develop and expand since settlement on the basis that farmers can grow well what they can grow. But now, in the advent of modern technology, instant communication and rapid market intelligence, I believe that the days of just hoping that whatever we grow can be sold at a good price in world markets has become and is be continuing to become an ever increasingly risky approach to marketing and thus remaining relevant. Buyers worldwide are now much more discerning and they can source product from anywhere instantly and seamlessly to match their requirements. So to me it's obvious that to maintain and build competitiveness, Australian agriculture has to understand how to reverse engineer this value chain. That is, to know what is the high value product that buyers want? What are the quality standards to command a premium price? And what are the assurance standards that buyers need to know before they buy? How many agribusiness players in this room understand the entire value chain? Could each of us answer what our core product is used for in the process of delivering the consumer a high quality, appetizing food that meets their taste, lifestyle and nutritious needs? So where does that leave us in addressing the opportunities for mixed farming? Well in my world, that means growing wheat and canola on tomato paddocks after two years so that they act as an adequate disease break, replace carbon in the soil and generally manage the land we lease much better. Mixed farming in Kagome, Australia is growing carrots in the autumn so that a winter harvest keeps the processing plant alive, local people employed through the year and overhead recovery to keep processing tomato paste and dice prices down. Vertical integration is also a key aspect of this strategy. As we say in Echuca, there aren't two profits in tomatoes. Taking our, out our suppliers, their costs and profit margins is a critical step in reducing the input costs and remaining competitive. Thus, our group has acquired a United Genetics, a global seed enterprise located in California, in order to design our own seeds. Farming division today manages more than 2,500 hectares of leased ground, compared to 72 hectares in 2004. We negotiated an industry deal with Caltex for ourselves and our growers, which is transparent and on the internet. Farming division has reverted to direct seeding, delivering higher yields and lower costs as opposed to transplants. And I'm personally involved in negotiating with the Shire to permit A double trucks rather than just rely on the B doubles we use today. So now we're going to be ambitious. 
I don't know where the volume's going to come from, but maybe we're not going to see it. It's available on our internet site, on our website, um, www.kagome.com.au. Okay, so before I continue further, just a little history on Kagome Australia. It was formed when the Kagome Group bought the company in July 2010, at the time the largest tomato processing factory in Australia. The tomato industry in Australia has indeed had a checkered past. In the 10 years prior to Kagome purchasing, we'd seen the number of independent tomato growers in Australia drop from more than 100 to just 15. Many tomato processing factories had either closed or recalibrated their businesses, and Australia's processing tomato volume had halved. <coughs> Today, Kagome Australia is a vibrant, vertically integrated horticultural company, planting and growing and harvesting processing tomatoes and carrots across 1,500 hectares from Colbin Abbon in Victoria to Mathara in New South Wales. All our farms utilize the latest techniques based on raised bed formats. We've got two bed, two meter direct meter beds, as well as the more traditional 1.5 meter beds for transplants. In season 2014, we processed close to 220,000 metric tons of tomatoes, nearly half of Australia's total production of processing tomatoes, and the company's all-time record. And we've got enough capacity now for 280,000 tons. Our customers are the well-known food manufacturers of Australia. They use our tomato proce processed paste and dice to augment their taste performances of their brands, including Legos, from Simplot, Master Foods, and Dolmio from Mars Foods, Latina from General Mills, to name a few. We also seek to export, sending more than 500 metric tons to Unilever India last year and some 250 tons to Unilever Pakistan last week. Compliance with Unilever's sustainability program, Muddy Boots, as well as having fresh care, FSSC 22000, and halal certifications has assisted our company to be a global source for high quality tomato products. The company will have revenue of $70 million in 2014 and is investing some $25 million this year in three major projects, a new food service plant, a wastewater treatment facility, and a new venture into growing and processing carrots. The key to the future proofing of, of the Australian processing tomato industry is to meet and or beat the price of landed Californian paste. The controllable variables, variables that we will deliver such an outcome are scale, and the garnering of the economies that scale delivers. Embedding IT so that we've got facts, not conjecture. And adding value, thus reducing our reliance on selling into a global commodity market. I contend that there's an enormous opportunity in Australia for far more effective integration of rain-fed mixed farming systems, irrigating farming systems, and secondary processing and value adding to the target high-value domestic and international markets. Obviously, there's some recent positive examples, such as culinary soybeans, and we've heard some examples this morning as well. Also, canola from other specialty seed and vegetables, high with product value and consumption. For today's forum, I'd like to pose the question, why does that, this not happen more? So this model that we've developed looks at that very aspect of how we can integrate more across different aspects. At today's forum, or at any other number of similar conferences, we can focus on agronomic and marketing opportunities for value adding, but we also need to address some of the more fundamental factors imposed by our governments that influence and in many cases determine the operating environment or value adding to Australia's agricultural produce. Of the factors that severely impact the competitiveness of value adding and hence, as I contend, to the competitiveness of Australian agriculture generally, to me there are just three. Water, energy and logistics. Okay, access to irrigation water is the number one challenge to ensuring a competitive agribusiness sector. The existing system is detracting from farmers in regional Australia growing more produce. To the uninitiated, it seems somewhat ironic that there's been significant rain in the catchments and Lake Ilden is at 85% of its total capacity Yet irrigation water is close to $100 a megalitre in the temporary market and $1,520 a megalitre in the permanent market for high reliability shares in the Golden Valley. Kagome Australia has 100% of its tomato crop irrigated by subsurface irrigation drip. 
and we use 13,000 megaliters per year. Last year the company paid $75 per megaliter, while the price when season 2012 opened was $27 a megaliter. Ideally, I'd like to be investing in improving our capability further and employing more local people rather than paying a premium for irrigation water. We understand that the Murray-Darling Basin has returned water to the environment and that irrigation water is now subject to market forces. But why are we locking up so much water in Victoria via conservative carryover? This results in dams spilling. Some 1.5 megalitres on the Murray system in 2013 alone. We should be using this water for far more productive purposes. I'm calling on our elected leaders, whoever they may be, to number one, amend current legislation to ensure state and federal appointed environmental water holders issue a public statement annually on the strategy for the water which exceeds their environmental goals. Two, make available each year that percentage of the water carryover held in the water spill account that aligns to the risk of a spill as assessed by the Water Authority. At the moment, Ilden has a 50% chance of spilling. I'd like 50% of that 50% made available. And thirdly, amend current legislation to ensure corporations which receive annual water allocations have to allocate a minimum percentage of what they don't intend using to the open market. Should these three steps be taken in full and without delay, I believe the irrigation water market would self-correct and the price for both temporary as well as permanent allocation would adjust, more closely reflecting the balance of supply and demand rather than a balance that is readily subject to artificial manipulation. A fourth step, and here I'll be a bit controversial, that I believe that needs serious consideration is actually to create more capacity for rain-fed water storage by simply building another dam. Like Lake Gildan, another mega million megaliters would make many of the issues I've outlined earlier redundant. Two, energy. Energy, especially natural gas, is the second challenge to ensuring a competitive agribusiness sector. Australia has always had the twin advantages of substantial deposits of natural resources as well as cheap access to energy. We pay a base price for natural gas today in excess of $5.50 per gigajoule. My contract tells me that I can't tell you the exact number, but believe me, it's over $5.50 a gigajoule. While our competitors in California pay $4 a gigajoule. Additionally to the base price, we are charged peak injection fees, withdrawal tariffs, meter and distribution charges, all of which add to $1.38 per gigajoule, and then add the carbon tax, which was worth $1.24 a gigajoule, representing $400,000 on our bottom line last year, you get to the figure of $8.12 a gigajoule in 2014, compared to 2008, the first full year of production in Echuca, where the price was $3.64. That's over 200% increase in those years for gas alone. Regretfully, I believe that we must now prepare for a base price between $10 and $12 a gigajoule over the next 18 months. If prices continue to rise at such a rate, without the appropriate transition phase, regional Australia may end up with a very worthwhile natural gas pipeline network, but the infrastructure will be empty because few of us will be able to afford to use it. There's no policy mechanism in Australia like California where gas is not to be exported until domestic demand is satisfied first. Thus our governments have sacrificed any capacity they may have had in assisting food processors using natural gas to maintain international competitiveness. Let's briefly consider electricity. In a number of ways, gas and electricity can be interchangeable for the energy requirements for cooking and dehydration in food processing. But again, there are major policy anomalies in the supply of electricity to industry. Compare the supply of electricity to, to us and that of Alcoa Aluminium Smelter in Portland, which is provided with electricity at the price that is linked to the world price of aluminium. The Alcoa plant uses about 10% of the total energy generated in Victoria, and the electricity is delivered and available to Alcoa at $14 a megawatt hour. In contrast, I paid in June $100 a megawatt hour. So, 
called on our government again and our esteemed leaders to create more natural gas supply opportunities so that, that second tier companies can enter the market for exclusive domestic exploration and sale. Introduce a market hub to make pricing more transparent, thus no reservation, no price control, but an open gas market hub. And three, develop a mechanism for a transition from our current defective marketplace so that there is capability to prepare and withstand the increased costs of international parity. Should these steps be taken in full, I believe the natural gas energy sector will be more transparent and that the price of natural gas would self-correct to reflect the volume, which is substantial, that will be available on the market by 2020. The third point is logistics. Logistics is the third challenge to ensuring the competitive agribusiness sector. All finished goods from our processing plant in Echuca, Moama, are shipped by road freight. In 2015, this will be the equivalent of 2,520 foot container equivalents, of which 35% are destined to one location, Melbourne Port, for export purposes. Road freight is expensive. For example, it costs $75 to truck one metric ton of tomato paste from Echuca to Sydney. Full truck is more than $1,300. Australia's rail infrastructure is well below international standards. Tracks are antiquated, restricting loads, speed, and freight logistics. And there is still a lack of compatibility in rail freight lines and stock between states. There's a minimum, if any, market competition for rail freight in any one region, and little, indeed not any, incentive for owners of track and stock to invest in standardizing freight systems between states. The standard for a train freight in Canada is 10,000 tonnes per train with a 40 tonne axle load weight. In Australia, the standard for train freight is 2,000 tonnes. That's one-fifth per train with a 16 tonne axle load weight. The highway cost of diesel at the moment in California, for those who have been over there recently, is $1.05 Australian per litre. Of course, in Australia, it's 163 right now. That's 55% more than our Californian competitors, and our distances are substantially longer. Let's take fuel tax credit. Fuel tax credit rates for the taxable liquid fuels, diesel and petrol, for heavy vehicles traveling on any public road in Australia are 12 cents a liter, independent of distance traveled and proximity to city centers. The fuel tax credit rate for agriculture operations in the paddock is three times that amount at 38 cents per liter. Kagome, Australia cannot claim this higher tax fuel credit rate for transport of tomatoes within the same agricultural value chain from the paddock to the processing plant because there are sections of public road between the paddocks and the facility. Integral to efficiency of logistics is consistency of regulation between states. We source tomatoes from both northern Victoria and southern New South Wales. We've got different locations to manage the weather and production risk. Our factory is only five kilometres from the Victorian uh, New South Wales border. And B double trucks are allowed on both the roads of Victoria and New South Wales. But A double trucks are only allowed in New South Wales. If we were to have A double trucks next season, we'd reduce our truck, truck, truck journeys from 6,000 to 4,600 in one season. So, I call on our elected officials to create a faster and efficient freight rail option for agribusinesses in regional Australia currently serviced by passenger rail services. Introduce an appropriate fuel tax credit rate for agricultural produce from the field to processing plant or sales market or distribution centre. And develop a standard certification across all states for A-double vehicles so that standards are transparent and common. Should these three steps be taken in full with that delay, I believe the cost of logistics would decrease significantly, reducing the tyranny of distance between farm and customer, making Australian agribusinesses more competitive. So in summary, today I've made comment on three of the government's policy settings that clearly have a severe and negative impact on the international competitiveness of Australian agribusinesses located in regional Australia. I've commented on the government policy settings relating to transparent irrigation management, competitive energy pricing, 
and logistics infrastructure. Recently, the Government of Australia announced a number of inquiries related to the policy settings impacting on international competitiveness of Australian agriculture and agribusinesses. One is the Agriculture Competitiveness White Paper. Another is the Competition Policy Review, while another is the Energy White Paper. Kagome Australia has made submissions to the Agriculture Competitiveness White Paper and the Competition Policy Review. In those submissions, we identified and featured the three issues of detailed here today, as well as the challenges faced by businesses such as ours to attract, employ and retain high performance labour, as well as the importance of R&D and the role which innovation plays in making us competitive. I invite you to track those changes down through the relevant government websites or go to the Kagome Australia website. There's no doubt in my mind that if Australia is to achieve the National Food Plan issued by the Federal Government in 2013 or the Food to Asia Plan issued by the Victorian Government in March 2014, our elected leaders will have to address the policy settings with regard to water, gas and logistics. The message is clear. I believe the time is now to act. Quite simply, agribusinesses, food processing and manufacture, as well as value adding, will not survive the global marketplace if the current policy settings impeding our competitiveness continue. I thank you for your attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. And um, there's some real challenges there in terms of uh, government. And uh, certainly it's a pity we haven't still got our DG here, that they could have taken some of those messages away with him. Um, colleagues, I'm very conscious of time. Um, as John said, we're running um, 25 minutes uh, late. We didn't. Uh, we actually lost no time on that session, so it was very good. But we're 25 minutes late. Um, any questions to any of those speakers or comments? Yes, please. Speak up, please. Yes. How do you find um, your ability to contact and get this information out so that it's taken out? I know this is part of the early discussion because not all of them read the white paper. That's true. Um, I'm, I'm continually surprised by the fact that they feign ignorance of these issues, which tells me a number of things. That there's three reasons why a government issues a white paper. One, they want to damn the policies of the previous administration. Two, they want to use it as a promotion for their ideas. Or three, they're genuinely looking for ideas. That's the only three reasons they would issue a white paper. We seem to have a lot of white papers at the moment. If I look at federal strategy right now, there doesn't seem to be any, as far as I'm concerned. So therefore, they must be looking for ideas. I think the reason the green paper is late is because they actually can't get their minds around it. It should have been issued weeks ago if we're going to make the end of the year deadline for the white paper. So unfortunately, I believe many of our politicians, particularly in the agribusiness sector, are very sympathetic. They're very genuine. They definitely want to support us, but they actually have no clue how to do it. They don't know enough about the mechanisms of government to unlock the secrets of how to move forward. And one of those things is about representation, uh, effective representation. and. Um um, I spent seven years working in uh, North America and uh, looking at uh, representation to politicians by uh, U.S. agricultural organizations, and I can tell you they are hammering uh, Capitol Hill um, all of the time on these sorts of issues. I want to pick up something interesting, John. There was the Business Council of Australia had a report prepared by McKinsey, and it was in the Australian about ten days ago and it compared competitiveness of the sectors in Australia versus the US. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is right, there's two green lines there, and there's a lot of red lines. So most industries compared to the US are not competitive. The big green line, where we're more competitive, is agriculture. So despite, and this really adds to the frustration that John's been expressing, 
despite all of those barriers there, actually, it's about the only industry where we're significantly more competitive um, than the US. Imagine what would happen if we had a much better enabling environment. Just one further point. Uh, for the Green Paper, I've actually put together a small group of like-minded, relatively small size agribusinesses so that we can make our submission back to the Green Paper specifically as, as a group. Uh, if anybody's interested in joining us, and we're only focused on those three issues I, I mentioned in our talk today, if anybody's interested in joining the group, there's about 12 of us at the moment, mainly in Victoria, so I'm here in a New South Wales audience, so if, if anybody would like to join us, uh, please come and talk to me afterwards. Um, I think we're going to uh, wrap up this session here because we are running a little late, but three great presentations talking about some of the real opportunities that uh, an effective and efficient post-farm gate uh, sector does, but also some of the challenges. But one of the things that resonated with me from all three presentations is about what these effective operations do in terms of local employment. And we heard that a bit with the value-adding talks as well. And uh, that's something um, that if we're looking at a, a social and community base is so critical. And every one of them demonstrated, um, with all the challenges, the tremendous impacts on local employment and uh, not to be uh, overlooked. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Angus and Richard. <laughs>